Okay, let's talk now about the first section of chapter 10, Cell Growth and Division. Um, so, of course, we learned early on that cells are the basic units of life, and without cells you don't have living things. So, of course, a study of cells is important. I mean, we looked at the structure of cells, of plant and animal cells, with all their organelle and such. And um, we looked a little bit at some of the processes that happen inside cells in terms of cellular respiration and uh, photosynthesis in the case of photosynthetic organisms. But um, as we saw when we talked about the characteristics of life, uh, living things are made of cells. And as part of the cell theory, we saw that new cells come from pre-existing cells. So the division of cells, the making of new cells, is an important process. Um, now, this section starts with this question, is there a limit to the size of cells? That is, can they only get so big or so, or so small for that matter? Um, and as we'll see, actually the question to this is yes, they really can only be so big or small because you do have to fit sort of a minimum amount of stuff in that cell for it to do what living things need to do. And we'll also see there's a limit to the size they can have, although there are some exceptions. There are some cells that are quite large, and I'm going to let you investigate that and report back in class as to what, what you find. There is a little bit of debate about what exactly is the largest cell, but we'll see what you find out. Um, but for the most part, as we know, cells are relatively small. Um, So, why are most cells pretty small? Well, let's take a look at, do a little geometry here, if you will. And so, of course, surface area. Surface area is a characteristic of any anything that has a surface, if you will. And it is something that's measured basically in two dimensions, okay? Whereas volume, as we know, is something that has three dimensions, x, y, and z axes. Okay, so surface area is to the square, uh, square root, and volume is to the cube root. All right, well, let's, what does that mean for objects? So here we have three cubes, so they're the same shape, but they're of different sizes. And when you look at the surface area of those three things, so clearly the larger one has more surface area than the smaller one, and the other one is in between. And of course the surface area is just the uh, size of one of the faces, a one by one centimeter times six, because there's six faces on this cube. And the same here, this one is two by two times six, so 24 centimeters squared, and the larger one, 54 centimeters squared. So clearly, surface area is increasing. So let's look at the volume. So the volume is basically one of those sides times the other side times the third size. And so this first one is, of course, a centimeter cubed because it's just one times one times one. But now, when we increase the two by two by two, this one is eight cubic centimeters, and this one three by three by three, 27 cubic centimeters. So the volume is increasing as well. But now let's take a look at the surface to volume ratio. And of course, in this one, it's six to one. So we have a six to one ratio of the surface to volume. What's the next one? Well, 24 divided by eight, three to one ratio. And the last one, 54 divided by 27, a 2 to 1 ratio. So what's happening? The ratio is decreasing. That is, the ratio of surface area to volume is decreasing. Does that make sense? Let's look at the volume. Essentially, the volume increases. Um, but what's happening? The volume is increasing at a faster rate 
than the surface area. Here, the surface area went from 6 to 24, which is an increase of four times. But this time, it went uh, the volume went from 1 to 8, an increase of eight times. And the same here, 24 to 54, 8 to 27. So the volume is increasing at a faster rate than the surface area as an object of the same size gets bigger to bigger. So the ratio of surface area to volume is decreasing. Essentially, in this one, there is more surface area relative to its volume than this one. All right. So what the heck does it have to do with, with cells? Okay, think of it this way. So what does a cell need to do? A cell needs to get food in, and it needs to get waste out. If it's a cell that makes some kinds of material, some kinds of enzymes that it needs to export, those things need to get out of the cell. All right, so we've got these cells. I didn't mean to draw that line there. Let's erase that, start again. All right, so we've got these two cells, and one is much bigger than the other. And so if something is being produced inside that cell, it, depending on how deep inside the cell it's being produced, it has the possibility of being produced much further away from the edge of the cell. So that substance has to be transported a further distance to get to the outside of that cell. As we saw with metabolism or cellular respiration, cells in the process of cellular respiration produce heat, and that heat needs to be gotten rid of. The larger an object is, the harder it is to get rid of that excess heat. So for the reasons of getting rid of excess heat, getting rid of waste, basically transporting waste out, and also just transporting things that need to be exported from the cell, this is much more easily done in the smaller cell than in the larger cell. So essentially, cells for the most part are limited in size because in smaller cells, it's much easier to get things in and out of those cells and do what the cell needs to do relative to a much larger cell. All right, cell division. So why do cells need to divide? Why do we need to make new cells? Well, of course, with growth, for something to go from one cell to more cells, you have to produce them. They have to divide. Sometimes in multicellular organisms, we have to repair things. Or sometimes have to replace things. Sometimes certain cells just get old and they need to be replaced, broken down, and replaced with a new cell. <clears throat> so these are all reasons why, particularly in a multicellular organism. Now, also, reproduction. Some th organisms, like microbes, bacteria, they just consist of a single cell. So essentially, in producing another cell, they essentially reproduce a form of asexual reproduction. They produce a clone of themselves through simple cell division. <clears throat> now, this is a very common form of reproduction in, in microbes, single-celled organisms. Um, now, in multicellular organisms, it's not as common, in particular in animals. Animals often don't reproduce asexually, and some, like us, people, we don't do it at all. Um, but here are two examples. This is an organism known as a hydra. It's a small aquatic organism, sort of kind of like a jellyfish, but it tends to just sit in one spot, doesn't float around. You can see this uh, new individual that's budding off the parent individual. Also, in, in sea anemones, they can split into two and form two new individuals, again, producing a clone of each other. Uh, plants, it's more common than in animals. You'll have a plant that can send out a uh, what they're calling a runner here or is a horizontal stem that then further down the stem can sprout new leaves and new roots. And that can ultimately, if this connection is severed, essentially be a new individual 
but again, it's produced asexually. It's a clone of the parent plant. It has the same genetic constitution. Um, but many organisms uh, do reproduce sexually. And um, so that's an interesting situation because it brings together two individuals. Um, so instead of having with asexual reproduction, one individual producing two identical individuals with, this would be asexual, with sexual reproduction, we have two individuals who together produce one. Um, now, of course, as you know, I mean, that's the common way in, in people we tend to have just one child, but many organisms have multiple child, dogs, cats, etc. But if you think about it this way, what's really happening is you have two cells that to get together and they produce one cell. And so, of course, in people and other animals and in plants and other sexual reproduction, reproducing organisms as well, these would be the reproductive cells that are found in these organisms. And so in females, it would be an egg cell and in males, it would be a sperm cell. And so these are the reproductive cells that we produce through sexual reproduction. And so it takes two of those cells getting together to make one new individual, which starts out as this thing called a zygote, which is a fertilized egg. Now, sexual reproduction doesn't always happen that way. Here is a single-celled organism, um, a type of protist, and it's one that can reproduce both asexually and sexually. And so with asexual, it just kind of splits in two and makes a copy of itself. In sexual reproduction, it doesn't do it really the same way that we do in terms of producing reproductive cells, because again, it just consists of one cell, but they, have, they do have a form of sexual reproduction in which essentially two separate individuals get together and they form a connection with each other and they essentially exchange genetic material. Um, and that genetic material is combined together and you produce new individuals that have a different genetic constitution than the previous ones. Um, you notice you're not really producing new cells. You just have two cells that give rise to two cells. But the again, the interesting thing here with this form of sexual reproduction in a single-celled organism is you're producing new genetic combinations compared to the parental uh, individuals. So with that in mind, I want you to think about... <clears throat> the pros and cons, the benefits and downsides of these two forms of reproduction. And see if you can come up with at least a couple um, for each one, each form of reproduction. And we'll talk about this in class. Okay.